Flow is one of the most important process variables in almost every industry, whether continuous process, batch, or hybrid, from bottling to chemicals to water wastewater. Hi, I'm Walt Boyce, editor of Control and ControlGlobal.com, with another Back to Basics in Flow Measurement for the Process Automation Media Network. This edition is sponsored by Anderson Hauser. Anderson Hauser is a leading supplier of measuring instruments and automation solutions for the industrial process engineering industry. Now, today we're going to talk about two of the most important types of flow meter, turbine flow meters and electromagnetic flow meters. So let's talk about turbine flow meters first since they are the oldest of the velocity sensing or volumetric flow meters. Invented in the late 1700s, yes that's right, the 1700s by a guy named Waltman, the basic structure of his meter looks very much like a turbine meter of today. There's a rotor which turns with the flow. The speed of the rotor is proportional to the velocity of the fluid going past it. Waltman used mechanical gears to get his signal to the register, just as most turbines do today in the water and wastewater industries. Turbines are not positive displacement flow meters, however, they're volumetric, and their measurement is based on velocity. But they are extremely accurate. Some designs, even the mechanical meters, can be used for custody transfer in water, hydrocarbons, and in gas flows. Turbine flow meters can be found in aviation fuel metering, natural gas pipelines, specialty liquids in the chemical industries, in the food and beverage industries, and in medical applications too. Turbine meters come in all types, including propeller meters, paddle wheel meters, impeller meters, but they all work by converting the rotational energy of a spinning prop to velocity-based volumetric flow. They can have entirely mechanical designs, be electromechanical hybrids, or have solid state sensors picking up pulses from the rotor as it spins. Turbine meters are sensitive to temperature and viscosity of the fluid and to fluid density. And they're also highly susceptible to fouling and should only be used on clean fluids and gases. Particulates, rocks, bottles, and rags immediately foul the prop and the meter must be repaired. Also. As Dr. Flowmeter says, overspinning the rotor by putting a higher flow rate than it was designed for may cause the rotor to break and you're going to find it downstream somewhere. Turbine meters also have a size limitation. It's very difficult to make a turbine meter much over 12 inches or 305 millimeters in diameter because the rotor becomes huge and its own mass interferes with its ability to spin. It takes a lot more velocity to spin a really big rotor. Insertion turbine meters have been designed, but their accuracy is significantly reduced. So what to do? Well, in the late 1940s, the Dutch faced a real difficulty. They were trying to drain the Zuider Zee, and they needed a way to measure the flow through the sluice gates into the North Sea. They found themselves looking at Faraday's law and realized that water, even seawater, is a moving conductor. They built big pipes with coils wrapped around them and a non-magnetic liner inside them and set electrodes in the pipe walls at right angles to the flow. The flow produced a very small current, picoamperes, just like Faraday said it would. This small current was directly proportional to the velocity in the pipe. In fact, it was directly proportional to the average velocity of the entire flow which made it possible to measure the flow rate incredibly accurately without any moving parts whatsoever. Pretty cool. Electromagnetic flow meters, also called mag meters, are very accurate too. Because they sense the average velocity in the pipe, they can be accurate to 0.5% of indicated flow rate over most of their measurement range or even better. Of course, there's a kind of insertion meter that uses the electromagnetic principle, but it's nowhere near as accurate as the spool piece designs that we're talking about here. Today, electromagnetic flow meters, mag meters, are used in just about every industry where the liquids are conductive. That's why you don't see them in many oil refineries or pipelines. Remember that moving conductor? That's the fluid, and it has to have a minimum conductivity of around 5 microsiemens. Below that, it won't work well or at all. No output current because no moving conductor. In the 60 or so years since the first mag meters were in installed in the dikes of the Zyder Z, the number of manufacturers has proliferated. David Spitzer and I are the authors of the Consumer's Guide to Magnetic Flow Meters, and we've identified more than 50 manufacturers globally. 
Not all of them make good devices, not all of them sell globally, and a few of them make sizes larger than 12 inches or 305 millimeters. What this means for end users is that the price of owning a magnetic flow meter has dropped precipitously since the 1970s. In 1976, for example, the average price of a mag meter was $4,000 plus $1,000 more for every inch diameter over 4 inches. So basically, if you wanted a 96 inch or 2438 millimeter diameter flow meter, it was going to cost you 96 grand. Such a meter today, even though only a few vendors make them, will cost you less than half that. Magnetic flow meters can't do everything. As I said earlier, they can't handle low conductivity flows. They also can't easily handle very high conductivity liquids like seawater. However, special designs have been produced and they mostly work. They can't handle rapidly changing conductivities well either. But solids, rags, sticks, even a small car, if the meter's big enough, go right on through. This makes them ideal for flows from sanitary and pharmaceutical products, all the way up to huge wastewater flow meters for the largest treatment plants. There you have two of the workhorses of flow measurement. Between them, they handle well over 30% of all liquid flows, and turbines handle many, many gas flow applications, too. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Anderson Hauser, for making this video possible. And we'd also like to thank Spitzer & Boys, LLC, for the material from the Consumer's Guide to Magnetic Flow Meters and from An Evening with Dr. Flow Meter. David W. Spitzer also provided information from his Industrial Flow Measurement Handbook. This has been another in the Back to Basics series from the Process Automation Media Network. I'm Walt Boys. Thanks for watching.